Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for um, dialing into this Zoom conference. Um, we're, I'm Helene Becker. For those of you who don't know me, I cover airlines and aircraft leasing for Cowan, and um, and I also do some other random stocks. This afternoon, though, we're really excited to have Flight Aerospace Solutions, a Calgary-based company. I guess you're Calgary-based. Um, and this afternoon, we have with us um, Bill Tempany and Alana. Um, it, Bill is CEO of, um, of, of uh, Flight and Alana Forbes is CFO. And so I will just make a couple of comments. Bill is a, is a serial entrepreneur and was named interim CEO of Flight in June of last year. Previously, he was chairman of the board um, in October of 2015 and continues to serve as a director of the company. He has more than 35 years of experience in high tech companies, more than 15 years of experience in the public markets um, and has been with Flight for a number of years now. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the presentation time over to Bill and Alana. And um, if you have any questions, you can ask them either anonymously through helene.becker at cowan.com or in the chat, and I will ask your questions anonymously. So, um, Bill, with that, I will leave it to you. Thanks very much, Helene. We uh, really appreciate being invited to the Cohen Conference. Uh, we're excited about what we're doing in aviation and, and where we believe the industry is going and some of the things it has to overcome to get here. Um, our first slide is our disclaimer, which everybody's read, I'm sure. Um, not going to spend any time on it, but all the standard disclaimers for a public company. Um, I've been around, uh, I actually started in 2002, so this is my 19th year at flight. Uh, and so we've been through a bunch of the, uh, the various crashes over time. I don't quite go back to 1945, but very close to it. And uh, every time we had a catastrophe like the Asian crisis or the uh, SARS crisis, everybody looked at how horrible it was for the aviation industry. But when I found this ICAO slide, I thought it really shows the difference between this time and all the other times. I think that the, uh, the industry, everybody understands is a necessity. The world isn't going to work without air travel. Uh, but it's doing without air travel in lots of creative ways. And people are, are, are anxious for air travel to come back. Um, I don't know where you are today, but in Calgary, it's about minus 22 or 23 degrees today. Uh, we, we know there's no dengue fever around, but uh, we'd sure like to see a palm tree and, and get away from this. And I think the pent up demand for travel is uh, going to really, once, once we get the vaccinations, it's really going to open things up and there'll be a very strong recovery in, in different kinds of, of travel. Next slide, please. So if you look at the uh, passenger volumes just over the last 12 months and what's happened to them, uh, one of the things that uh, you notice is that things have started to come back and, and uh, there's been another dip in different parts of the world. The changes that are happening in the airline industry are, are different by region, different by type of aircraft, different by type of carrier. And I think if you look at China and Russia and see how they've come back uh, much slower in Europe and in North America, but we are all looking at when we can get on a plane next and where we can go. Uh, I know most of us that uh, have been in business for a long time rely on face-to-face -face meetings and talking to people. Um, our families expect us to show up at the airport for visits and, and uh, domestic travel will definitely be the first to recover. Uh, we're seeing that uh, in North America. It certainly is how it happened in in uh, Russia and, and China. Uh, the only thing that's down in China these days is the international travel, no long haul travel. So on the next slide, please. Um, one of the things that Flight has a, a very uh, lucky position is that we've got a very uh, varied customer base. Uh, if you look at the airline industry and break it into its segments from the long haul, the, 
remote operators like uh, uh, people that fly in Africa and Northern Canada, uh, the differences between Russia and China and Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, whether they're short haul international or, or uh, to vacation destinations. Um, freight carriers have been very, very fast to recover. They didn't really even take a hit. Um, this is a picture of an SF cargo airline uh, in China that uh, is one of our customers in China. And uh, all of our freight carriers have had increased usage and, and very high utilization of their aircraft um, over the entire pandemic. And I think it's getting stronger, not weaker. Um, the, the bottom picture, the recovery rates picture, uh, that's actually COVID vaccine being loaded on one of our customers' aircraft at Canadian North. Uh, flying vaccines to Northern Canada. And our carriers in Africa and Northern Canada have been very uh, steady in, in what they've been flying because they fly essential services. They do medical evacuations, they fly food and, and specialty freight mail to faraway places that there's no other way to get things there that people need to survive. So we look at the airline different different than saying the airline industry. We look at our customers as customers that are in areas that are severely affected by COVID. Um, and a good example of that is our customer Air Asia, based in Malaysia. Uh, they were flying about 130 aircraft when the pandemic hit. Uh, they're down to less than 20 aircraft in really active service right now because you can't fly very far in Malaysia and all of the borders are closed. They can't fly to any of the neighboring countries. So there is a real difference in what type of carrier and how those things react. So our next slide uh, talks about the studies that have been done by the industry. Industry is looking at the ways to recover without recovering the same cost base that they had when they started into COVID. So at the start of COVID, they were very large organizations with lots of people and lots of moving part. They're proactively looking at those operations to how they remain competitive and profitable. One of the interesting articles I saw this last week is that there are 30 new airlines starting as a result of the pandemic. They're all ultra low cost carriers. They're looking to come in and, and capture that pent up demand for people that want to take vacations and go see their families. And uh, 30 new airlines coming out of a pandemic like this is a real opportunity for a company like ours where they're looking for new systems and better ways to do things. We, uh, um, the, can we go back one, Elena? Sorry. Um, the, the study said that, uh, that all of the airlines out there are looking at digitalization and, and AI as uh, you know, two thirds of what they expect to spend money on is in those areas. So automation and, and the ability to take their data and transform that into what we're calling actionable intelligence is very high on their list. Uh, sustainability and environmental initiatives are very high on the airlines lists in part because some of the bailouts that were done in Europe for the major carriers were based on them becoming more fuel efficient and more environmentally conscious. And one of the things that flight's done for many, many years is track fuel, track CO2 emissions, the ability to, to help airlines reduce fuel burn by uh, whether it's piloting technique or routes or weather, a lot of different ways that we can help innovate the airline uh, to improve the customer experience and deliver value to our customers. Now, the next one. So when we look at our problem, we look at it from the airlines point of view. Airlines are made up of a lot of different areas that all have different systems and different needs. Uh, the airlines number one concern right now is conserve cash. You've got to be here to be here for the recovery. And, and so cash conservation is a big thing. Uh, we're fortunate in the fact that we have uh, about 80 customers globally flying. Uh, there's a total of about 3,500 aircraft equipped with our systems. There's about uh, 
900 of those today that are using data from our systems through our services. And we have the ability to help them take that data and do more with less. We can help them build technologies that will save them time and money and resources. And we want to do it strictly as a service. We're not there with the ulterior motive of some of the other data providers that are trying to sell them parts or new aircraft or other services. We're there strictly to provide a service to them to help them find money, uh, sp stop spending money, improve their profits. Getting maximum profit from their asset is their number one goal today. Next one. So how we do that, there's three main areas that we're focusing our attention on. Uh, turnarounds is when the aircraft, from the time the aircraft lands to when it takes off again. Uh, there's a bunch of factors that happen during turnarounds that uh, real-time data, the ability to access information and people and get people in the right place at the right time is a way that we can save a lot of money. Um, if you can reduce ground delays, you can save up to 1% of the, of the annual revenues of the, of the company uh, by improving asset utilization, reducing the cost of crews, reducing the cost of services on the ground. Uh, irregular operations are always a headache for airlines and for passengers. Uh, anybody that's been trapped in a thunderstorm that puts the whole network behind or uh, you've got a, a, an unplanned maintenance event that takes an aircraft out of service. It's very difficult for the airline to reschedule people to get new aircraft, new crews in place to maintain customer satisfaction while you're doing it and reduce the cost of reassigning all that travel. You don't want to be booking your passengers on somebody else's aircraft and paying the fees for that. So. There's another half a percentage of savings that you can make in, in managing irregular operations. And fuel is a, a main cost for most of the airlines. It's either number one or two in every income statement for every airline. There's uh, uh, pass the, uh, the cruise on the, and the fuel are kind of half and half of the top two uh, costs to an airline. There's a bunch of regulations or, or recommendations that IATA has made to reduce fuel. Uh, we manage those, we track those, we give real-time reports to people so that they can manage their fuel consumption, which in track reduces, in, in turn reduces their CO2 emissions. We can do the tracking and reporting for the environmental measures that Corsi has brought out, and we can help them manage how much fuel they tanker. Um, if you're carrying a pound of fuel on a, on a flight, it probably takes a half a pound for the pound you're carrying, just carrying that pound of fuel. And, and we have all of the ability to look at the cost metrics of fuel costs at destinations, availability of fuel at destinations. Remember a lot of our carriers are flying in places that don't have a lot of services. So we need to be able to tell them when they should and shouldn't tanker fuel. And again, you can pick up another half a percentage on, on managing your fuel better. So we've had our customers and our prospects go through and, and have agreed that using these tools properly on a fleet of 100 aircraft, their net saving would be about $120 million over three years. So it's a significant saving to the airline. It's a significant saving to the environment. And it does give us much better utilization of the assets to do things like we're doing. Next one. So what we've done is this isn't a new system or a new product that we're building. What it is is taking existing tools that we have today and expanding the capabilities of those tools. So we're currently uh, installed in the factory on the A320, A220 and A330 aircrafts. We have approval for pretty well every other commercial aircraft on the planet today. And we have the highest quality voice performance of any SATCOM system out there. We've been doing SAS revenue for 20 years. We're a leader in the communication of real-time data, uh, whether it's airframe or engine or any error messages that come up on the aircraft. Uh, we've got a patent on triggered data streaming so we can meet the requirements of the timely recovery of data initiatives that ICAO is bringing out in the next few years. 
We've got health data on the aircraft that helps them configure their systems and their people and their aircraft to get maximum benefit out of them. And we have a broad service of uh, base that we've already deployed at all these airlines. So whether it's aircraft tracking or aircraft health monitoring, uh, the communications, weather information, we've got those systems in place today. So what we're doing is taking all of those systems and integrating them under a technology which we call JetBridge. What JetBridge does is combines the data from the aircraft, the data from the airline and the data from the airport using machine learning tools to give you real-time alerts to get the people to do what needs to be done to improve your turnaround times, to reduce your downtime, to improve your customer satisfaction and capture more profit through the better use of your assets. Next one. So we also have taken a lot of time and done a lot of work on our ESG considerations. Um, one, of the, one of the members of our board is on the Corsia Committee for North America. Uh, we all believe that we have a responsibility to help the airlines reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to make their operations more environmentally friendly. And we can help by tying the right crews and right routes and aircraft and making sure that the fuel loads are customized for those flights, that the real-time weather is, is available so they can uh, change flight paths if there's a better way, a shorter way to get to a destination, and looking after the aircraft health monitoring so that you're not burning fuel because you have a, a poorly configured or rigged aircraft. So environmental concerns are part of what we're doing on a go-forward basis and uh, part of the savings that we think we can do for the airlines. So right now, um, and this, this is probably a little bit out of date, uh, there's about $800 billion a year being spent by, world, by airlines worldwide. Um, and if you can make a 1% or 2% saving on, on turnaround times and airport charges and ground management, uh, that's between 4 and $8 billion in savings for the whole industry. That increased profits between five and ten billion dollars a year that they could be making, and a lot of that's fuel. But there's a lot of other areas that require better data, better information, better systems that we can help save money with. And I think on the previous slide we went through some of those, so I won't get into the details. But it's a big market and it's a big opportunity, and we already have a big slice of that market equipped with our equipment getting them to use actionable intelligence is the next step in, in what we're trying to do. So next one. So we are an agile company, uh, agile in every sense of the word. We use agile technology for our software development, but we're also very ready, willing, and able to uh, adjust what we're doing to what our customers need. Uh, we are firm believers that the industry is going to rebound and we're going to rebound with it. Uh, we've had uh, really good results in the last uh, 12 months and we continue to provide valuable service to our customers. Um, we had really, really good collections last quarter, which shows that our customers appreciate what we're doing and that the industry is starting to get its feet back under itself from what's been going on. Uh, we have the ability to work with airlines regardless of what aircraft types they fly. We can customize our solutions to do what they need to do. And all of our airlines are a big fish in our pond. Um, we're, we're dealing mainly with tier two and tier three airlines, and uh, they're all significant. They, we're a significant supplier to them, and they're significant to us. So very good relationship with our customers today. We do get unique access to information off the aircraft because of our specialty hardware. It allows us to do interesting things with the data that other companies wouldn't be able to because we get information that doesn't normally get fed into the, the systems that are out there today. So it's, uh, I think, a unique combination of capabilities, qualifications, industry knowledge, and tools that make us a really good option for our airline customers and, and prospects. Next one. Right now, um, one of the problems that we're working on fixing is that if you look at our revenue profile, uh, most of our revenue is coming from North America. We've got a lot of 
revenue coming from China and used to have a lot from Southeast Asia. Uh, Air Asia was one of our big clients and they're one of the ones that have been impacted the worst by COVID. Um, it was about 45% uh, each uh, North America and rest of the world and still 2% Europe. So we're working on some things to fill that void in Europe. We're working with some partnerships with some companies. We're looking at some opportunities to get a base there and get moving. Europe has about a third of the movements in, in aviation in the world and uh, we're not getting our fair share. So that's something we're working on fixing this year. And uh, the recovery of Southeast Asia will be a big part of the recovery for the rest, for the rest of the company when it comes back. And with that, I'll turn it over to Alana and she can uh, walk you through some of the financial results. Sure, so looking at flight by the numbers, our and these numbers are all as of Q3 2020, so up until September 30th, uh, our trailing 12 months of revenue was standing at 16 million, which compares to a pre-pandemic 2019 total of 21 million. So we have seen impact uh, of the pandemic on our revenues. Our contracted backlog that we expect to see in the near to intermediate term is standing at 34 million. Uh, the value of our contracts that have been signed and not yet delivered is actually much higher. It's in the uh, mid $50 million range, but we regularly scrub this number to make sure that we understand uh, what's realistic, especially given our customers uh, changing priorities and changing operations through these pandemic times. 55% uh, of our year-to-date revenues are recurring with 65% gross margins. Uh, that 55% split has been increasing over time as we uh, roll out our AI solution. Uh, we, at, in 2019, that number was more, uh, it was less than half, it was around 48% in the prior year. So we are increasing the proportion of our revenues that are recurring. Um, one of the things with flights, um, with flights business that's rather interesting is the uh, our, our solution is really sticky, particularly when we have hardware on an aircraft. Um, our customers, if they do leave us, it's mainly for Chapter 11 reasons. That's pretty much the only customers that we do see uh, leave. But once the hardware is installed on their aircraft, often it'll be returned to the lessor if they run into trouble. The lessor uh, distributes that aircraft to another potential customer of ours. That customer phones us up and says, hey, what is this AFERS unit all about? Um, and they become interested in the technology and often turn it on. So uh, a lost customer isn't necessarily uh, lost revenue in the long term for, for flight. One of our launch customers with our actionable intelligence program, uh, we got together with them early on when they were looking at becoming a launch customer for, for that product set. And we worked the numbers together and figured out that the ROI expected on the program was about 800%, which is a really compelling offering. Um, over our 22 years in commercial aviation, we have had our hardware flying on just under 3 million flights which converts to just over 4 million hours of uh, voice and data services on aircraft. So we have, we have a lot of history there. And looking at our financial results, um, you can see on the left, we're looking at revenue on the right, the picture shows you our gross margins over time. And looking at, on, at the revenue, there's, there are only, uh, three quarters in the 2020 numbers as compared to full year in the three years prior. But you can really see the impact that COVID has had on our revenues, both our overall revenues and our recurring. Um, recurring remains higher than in 2018 and 2017, but it, but it definitely has been impacted. Um, our gross margins typically run in the, the low 60, mid 60 percentile range. Um, it, it all depends on the type of revenue that's being generated each quarter. Uh, whenever we have hardware installs, that typically comes with uh, lower gross margins as we, um, it, historically, as we were dependent more on the hardware, um, now not so much with our focus, our refocus on SaaS and our actionable intelligence suite of, of products. 
Um, but we really, you know, were interested in getting the hardware onto the aircraft. So there was more incentive for us to give to our customers in that way. So that once the hardware had been installed, we would start that recurring revenue generating and providing value for our customers month to month. Looking at our historical financials, um, I'll just focus, whoops, I'll just focus on the nine month picture, uh, but you can see the last three years of full financials in the middle. Um, our nine month picture really does show, uh, particularly in the different, in the look at a, the different revenue streams, we have four types of revenue that we're tracking and earning. Um, you can see on the SAS line, the impact that COVID has had on our customers as their flights have been reduced and, their, and as they've had to ground some aircraft. Uh, the most impact that we've seen is on the hardware side as our customers are a bit shy to invest in capital expenditures as Bill was referring to when he talked about uh, the, the survey of how customers were planning on emerging from COVID. The pleasant surprise in 2020 has been our licensing revenue which came in higher than we were expecting. We've done a lot of work uh, since last March in our, on our operating expenses. We've made some permanent changes that we expect will continue. Um, we also were able to add uh, to access some government funding, which has helped on our operating, uh, reduce our operating expenses through the past nine months. And those reductions taken together with a higher gross margin have allowed us to minimize the impact on the bottom line that, uh, that the reduced revenues have brought to flight. Now, just a picture at the leadership team, uh, you know Bill and I now, and uh, the other three, the three Ds, uh, Derek in sales and marketing, another Derek in uh, BD and Daryl taking care of our solutions. Between the five of us, we on average have been at flight for 13 years. So uh, we know our business inside and out. We, uh, we have a lot of history in the, in the management team. And our board of directors bring a lot of diverse uh, spaces of knowledge to us. Um, their, their expertise in all their varying areas really makes for some interesting conversations, both at our board meetings and um, gives us a lot of options. If we uh, need some advice, we can call any of them up at any point. Uh, Barry Eccleston was the president of Airbus Americas during his career. Jack Alcott was the president of the NBAA. Uh, Nina Johnson, she started with us in early 2019. And she has a long history in fleet management. So she really understands uh, the inside of an airline's operations. Brent offers capital markets expertise. Uh, Captain Mary McMillan, she was the latest addition to our board of directors. She was most recently the VP of safety at Inmarsat. And she has an area of special interest in, uh, in the environmental side of the airline industry. Uh, the last three, Paul, Doug, and Mike, are all our Canadian directors, uh, together with Bill. Uh, Paul offers audit support. Um, Doug has a long history in software development, so he offers a unique perspective. And Mike helps us out on the legal side. So looking to flights near future, um, we're really excited about our strategic refocus particularly um, on our recurring revenues. We really want to grow that portion of our revenue in proportion to the rest. Um, refresh leadership, it was really good to have Bill back. He's, uh, he started with us, as he mentioned, 14 or 15 years ago, uh, took a break and came back in uh, last June to really lead us through, through these uh, pandemic times. As I talked about, we've got 34 million in near-term backlog. Uh, we're currently forecasting that we will become cash generative in the second and a half of this year. Uh, we're really, um, and hopefully the vaccines and such are made more um, accessible and, and people are able to, uh, to start flying a bit more and, and that will certainly help in, in our uh, second half plans. 
As of the end of Q3, we had just, just under $8 million uh, in liquidity available to us. So we ha have a fair bit of runway. Okay, and that is that brings us to the end of our slides. And Bill and I are here for the next uh, 10 minutes, I guess, and ready for to take your questions if you have any. Helene? Perfect. Thanks, Alana and Bill. That was a great presentation. And um, okay, so I have a few questions and there have been a couple that have been emailed over to me. First question up is um, with respect to hardware and software, do you need to have both installed on your aircraft in order to, um, in order to get the full benefit of the cost savings that you're talking about? It, um, there's there's a lot of the savings that we can do without having the hardware installed on the aircraft, but there's um, the things that require real time, like making sure that when you get to the gate, there's somebody there to bring you in and you don't sit for 10 minutes after landing. You need real time data from the aircraft for that. Uh, so it's a mix. There's probably somewhere, and it varies airline to airline, but there's somewhere between 30 and 70% of it that we can do without the box to get all of the benefit you have to have the box on board or some real time data feed to, to trigger the events. Gotcha. And then can somebody else do what you do? Um, it's like maybe you could talk about the moat around your business. So what do you do that nobody else can do and why somebody should go with flight? Um, and I apologize. I don't know a lot about this space because this is a little outside my normal day to day. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. The, the, the AFERS unit is uh, a very unique piece of hardware because um, it, what it started out doing was collecting the data that goes to the black box and giving giving us access to it. Then we started transmitting it by satellite. Then we got into SATCOM and then we got into air traffic control. But the beauty of the AFERS unit is the fact that it's got its own processor on board. We tie into lots of different data buses on the aircraft and we can also put in what are called discrete. So our own kind of sensors, our own uh, information gathering systems, uh, information that's gathered from things that don't go on the data buses. And then AFERS is programmable so that we know when and where to send those and how to send them. We send them in a very efficient small packet and it gives data off the aircraft that nobody else gets. And there's, there's pieces of it that people get through systems like ACARS, which is the old 45 year old VHF based uh, telex message that's sent from most of the commercial aircraft today that's very limited in what you can do and very expensive to change. We can change what comes off the aircraft while it's in flight. We can send a message from the ground and collect different data, get different sensors in real time. So we have a very unique advantage in, in the data we get, how we get it, and when we get it from anybody else out there. Gotcha. And then with respect to Europe, um, that was one area where you were talking about needing some um, more representation. Can you get that through Eurocontrol? Is that, can you work with Eurocontrol or, you know, in the US, can you work with the FAA to get data or is this something that has to be done through airlines? Well, Eurocontrol and the FAA and Transport Canada don't have anything other than location data. They okay. didn't get involved in the actual performance data on the aircraft. Um, the, the, the problem that we have in Europe, and, and it's no different in, in North America or in China, if you don't have people in country that are, that are known and, and respected by the, the clients, you have a really hard time getting a, getting a sale made. And Europe's the same. We've never had anybody based in Europe that was talking to the airlines that were selling our solution. So we're looking for partners in Europe that'll be uh, our feet on the ground in that, in that geography. 
Gotcha. And then what about going at it from the opposite direction? Instead of going to the airlines direct, can you go to the manufacturers and can you say to them, you know, we want to sell you this product and have it be an add-on at, um, you know, when, when the, when I'm saying this so badly, <laughs> have it, have it, have it. Is what they call it. What do they call it? Factory installed. Yes, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> can you do that and come at it that way? And, and then, then the airlines can just have access to it that way. Well, we are factory installed on Airbus on all airs, but it's through arrangement with L3. And the box that they put on through that arrangement is a, is a box that has limited functionality. It does ACARS transmissions, it does satellite voice, um, and I think actually that's it. So out of the 20 or 30 things an AFERS unit's capable of doing, they've turned two on. Now we had it had a have a deal uh, with Bombardier, and we're factory installed on the Q400 and as well as the CRJ, but they've stopped production of those. Right. We've worked with Boeing on the Eco Demonstrator and proven that they wrote a paper that uh, uh, validates that we can do the timely recovery of data that's required by OKO and the regulations that are coming out. Um, but as of today, they don't factory install it. Uh, they need a customer to ask for it, and we haven't found somebody to do that yet. We're very, very close, but not yet. Okay. Um, Embraer, uh, we've, we've talked to them about factory install. Uh, the ARJ-21, the new Chinese aircraft, they're installing AFERS uh, in the factory before they deliver those. So. Okay. Okay, so that, that could be another way to expand your reach. Absolutely is, yeah. Yeah, and then when you think about, um, okay, so shifting gears a little bit and liquidity and so on, are, um, are you, I noticed, um, I couldn't see very well, but I thought you said you had an undrawn revolver. Are there, you know, will you be coming to, I guess, I don't know if you can answer this question because you haven't reported year-end results yet, but but do you need to increase liquidity? Are you in a good spot right now to get from here to wherever you want to be next? I, I think all I can say until our year end comes out is that we're confident that uh, for the current business requirements, we're fine. Okay, that's, um, that's good to know too. What's next step? What's the next iteration um, and in terms of the product? Is it going... I, I, again, really badly asking, but is it going um, like this is 1.0 or you've been in business for 22 years. So I'm assuming that with technology improving over the past two decades, this must be product number, iteration number, maybe five or, you know, you keep it's, making it better. It's way more than version five. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and one of the things that, uh, that we've done over time uh, originally, when we built the AFERS unit, we had to buy our own servers and we had to do all our own connections for satellite and so on. Um, uh, seven or eight years ago, we went to uh, uh, cloud infrastructure and it wasn't called a cloud then. We uh, went to a shared service server. Um, about uh, four years ago, we moved to the Amazon cloud and we're using Amazon tool sets. Uh, we're an IBM business partner and we're using IBM tools for uh, machine learning and, and uh, artificial intelligence. We're using a bunch of the Amazon tools for transport players and, and all kinds of stuff that's way over my head technically. Um, but we definitely do keep up with technology. The thing that doesn't change, and one of the beauties of aviation is that uh, it, they don't change airplanes. Airplanes are around for 35, 40 years. And when they come out of the factory with a certain set of equipment, they keep that set of equipment for 30 or 40 years. So you don't see the technology change on the aircraft side of it nearly as bad as you do in real life. Like it isn't like the, the iPhone that if you haven't got a, a, two, a version that's at least two years or newer, it isn't going to work. Um, you have to have systems. And, and one of the things that made it very difficult for us that we've mastered 
is we've got stuff installed on aircraft that are 40 years old and we've got stuff installed on aircraft coming out of the factory and we handle them all the same way. It's We've got access to the data, we can interpret the data, we can transmit the data. So AFERS has got really unique capabilities to keep up with technology as it evolves on the airframe. That's um, that's very exciting, and, and I want to hear more, and I'm going to tomorrow morning. We have a panel discussion that Bill and Alana will be part of, or Bill will definitely be part of it, and, um, and, and we'll be talking with Volocopter as well, which is a vertical takeoff and landing company, and we'll be talking with Nexteon, which is um, used to be Roof Dynamics and is kind of ways for aircraft. And it sounds to me as though what they do and what you do are pretty complementary. So I'm really looking forward to tomorrow's panel. For those of you who are interested, it's 11 a.m. at the conference. So look that up on your agenda and make sure you stop by our, our meeting room. And um, I think with that, unless um, Bill or Alana, you have anything else you might want to add, um, I think that's uh, that's it. I don't see any questions in my email. I was just checking, and I I got all the questions that came in, and I don't see any in the um, in the chat room either. So I think we covered it all. Uh, is there anything you guys want to add? No, I appreciate being invited to this, and it's always great to tell our story. Um, the the uh, presentation that you'll have access to, plus our website, have our contact information, and Alana and I are happy to talk to anybody, investors or interested parties, or particularly customers. We're always open for that. So it's uh, very very good to be on this uh, format, and thanks for inviting us. Thanks very much for being here. I'll see you guys tomorrow, and um, thank you very much. Bye.